Hugging Face uh, actually published some benchmarks that show that Intel Habana 2 leads uh, NVIDIA A100 and H100 on a very specific model. Dan, I'll, why don't you kick this one off? And there you have it. That was it. That was all I had. But no, I, I mean, look, first of all, you ended where we're kind of picking up. But, you know, in the near term, we've got this gold rush to train. And this gold rush to train is basically largely a train that only goes to one station. And that's Jensen Huang's kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that kitchen is going to be so awesome by next year because I, I, I don't know. But the, I think there's a printing press being created in his uh in 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 the nvidia corporate headquarters but having said that in all serious you know whether it's talking to thomas kirian about the capabilities of the tpu whether it's intel whether it's amd's mi offerings whether it's grok's accelerators whether it's you know lattice semis fpgas with you know vision capabilities there are a lot of semiconductors that can do ai but right now the market's impression is that there's really only one and that's because there's this gold uh you know, gold rush to train large models and to build foundational models because right now the ability to use AI in your business using unique data sets is sort of the next frontier of opportunity for productivity gains and efficiency gains. But there's also this kind of overwhelming impression, Pat, and this is where we can, I think we can yeah. kind of have a little bit of a convo slash a debate that NVIDIA is the only company that can do it. And that basically there's a reason companies are waiting three to six quarters depending on who they are, to get their hands on an A100 or an H100. Um, and, and it has to do with a combination of the fact that NVIDIA has really what's considered to be a full stack you know, of, of capabilities, uh, the programming developer ecosystem around CUDA, but also just the fact that it's sort of the universal and most capable, most powerful. But the truth is there's a couple of trend lines going on that are important to note. The one is, well, you know, training is the next immediate frontier of opportunity longer term uh the ability to accelerate workloads and even do that on traditional um you know general purpose compute is actually a very large opportunity around inference the other thing is that when you're training very specific workloads there is something to be argued that an asic a specific you know um you know a, a semi that's built very specific to accelerate a certain type of workload could end up outperforming. And that's what Hugging Face, so this wasn't an Intel piece, but it's a yeah. partnership and a relationship. Intel and Hugging Face have very publicly been out there that they do have this relationship, but effectively announced that when they were training these vision language models, these very specific kinds of models, that the Habana Gaudi 2, which is the ASIC from Intel, actually performed substantially better than both the A100 and the company's newest and most powerful you know, uh, GPU, it's uh, A100. And so while this, again, Pat, I think is, it's a little apples and oranges, like kind of because obviously when you're buying NVIDIA, you could argue that I don't know what we're doing in all cases with this. So we want to have this most powerful general capability to do all things AI. But with many large companies building out specific foundational models, specific language models, the idea of being able to train more efficiently, and by the way, more price efficiently um, considerably becomes very interesting. So this whole bridge tower on Havana Gaudi 2, I think brings a really interesting debate, Pat, and it's kind of two debates for me. One is, you know, and by the way, we had a kind of a similar conversation around Grok with the, you know, LPU, they call it, right? An LPU, language processing. But is that, what is the capacity and aptitude for companies to go down the path of using an ASIC or a chip very specific to, to that? And two, what are the constraints? I Meaning, what are the reasons knowing that these are actually available today, they can be utilized right now in instances, both in the public cloud and purchase for on-prem, that companies aren't more thoughtfully considering the utilization of this technology from both an economics and a capability standpoint, Pat. And so to me, like I said, it's early days, but I think what we're starting here is a real conversation about the fact that there is a very powerful market position around the NVIDIA products. But there are competitive offerings in the other forms and that in many cases for specific kinds of workloads could become very compelling. So rather than droning on, I just want to kind of put that out there and maybe bounce it to you and maybe go back and forth a bit on this one. 
Yeah, I like to get back to the basics. I've been around chips for over 30 years. And one thing has always been true. There, there's been a continuum of efficiency and programmability. The most efficient, uh, the less programmable. And going from left to right, you have the, the CPU, the GPU, the FPGA, and the ASIC, right? The, the challenge with the ASIC is always, again, like you said, is how do I program that? And what they do is they, they put the flexibility on, uh, in, in the software to be able to run uh, different workloads. Uh, but when you get it there, it's going to be a heck of a lot more efficient than uh, a GPU or a CPU. To be clear, NVIDIA does have ASIC blocks on its GPU, right? Uh, they have transformers. They have uh, some, some, you know, heck on the Intel Xeon has four different ways to accelerate AI. So it's really this continuum. So it's not ASIC good, GPU bad, or GPU bad, ASIC good. GPU has taken advantage of the flexibility that, that particularly hyperscalers want uh, to be able to go to the next best thing. I mean, heck, uh, a year ago, we were still talking about recommendation engines uh, and visual uh, AI and object detection and, and recognition and self-driving cars. Right now, in this generative age, we're just doing some of the most wackadoodle stuff uh, out there with the GPU, right? How do you think all of these uh, initial LLMs were trained? They were trained on the A100, not the H100. Right, the H100 is just a beast of a device that that uh, cranks out foundational models uh, a lot more flexible, and that's the key is is flexibility. Uh, one thing I was I was interested in this one as well was that you know this wasn't inference and this wasn't training; it was fine tuning. Okay, uh, which and also I find interesting was this wasn't intel people these were hugging face people so that gives a tremendous amount of credibility but what all the listeners and viewers need to understand is that that habana gaudi 2 won't have the same level of uh advantage over nvidia or even amd in, in all use case this is a very specific use case using a very specific model uh, which was very similar to what we saw uh, with Grok, right? Using Llama 2, 70 billion. I also don't think that this can uh, claim to be uh, a, a large model um, as well, uh, given the size. This is, not, this is not one of these 70 billion uh, parameter models. It's, it's almost a billion parameters in, uh, uh, in total. But anyways, read the notes, read the show notes. Dan, any any final comments? No, I mean, look, it's it's an interesting inflection. You know, there's a lot of market concern and question right now whether or not there are other companies that are set to benefit from this AI gold rush. The disproportionate amount of revenue that's gone in one direction, the train only goes to one station, does bring up some relevant discussion points about healthy competitive ecosystems, about the need for alternative routes for enterprises, hyperscalers, small businesses to be able to benefit from AI. And in the longer run, how much do people that are running Salesforce with, you know, some sort of, um, you know, attrition risk uh, algorithm, right, care about what hardware that's being done on? You know, and I think over time, companies are going to look for efficiencies, especially on the inferencing side. So I think it's an interesting uh, debate, conversation to keep having. And I don't expect that it'll be the last time we're going to have it. Yeah, Dan, I mean, graphics used to be done on a GPU. Sorry, used to be done on a CPU. And then they put fixed function in to do to do 2D graphics. Uh, we used to have an accelerator uh, to use with spreadsheets and to crunch numbers, right? It was a plug-in chip, right? It was a math accelerator. And then it got sucked into the processor. So uh, historically... These things should calm down, but until they aren't calm, GPUs are going to have an operational advantage. 